Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to our next chapter that is your transfer pricing. So we now started with international taxation. So transfer pricing, the entire objective, the entire main aim objective of this chapter is to determine your arm's length transaction that is your ALP. Now arm's length transaction is necessary to determine because transfer pricing usually happens between two associated enterprises. So in such a case, it may be possible that the transaction, the price at which the transaction is actually taking place is not the real price. So therefore, it is used to determine your arm's length price. Your transfer pricing provision will be applicable only and only if it increases income or reduces the loss compared to what is filed in the return. Only then transfer pricing provisions will be applicable. That means in no case transfer pricing will reduce your income. In case of domestic transactions, in case of domestic transactions with specified business under section 80 IA. So now which are the specified businesses? Internet, telecom, SEZ and your generation and distribution of power. So if you learn, if you want to learn it, it is your SPIT. That is your S for SEZ, P for power, I for internet and T for telecom. So if, 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 if these are these four specified businesses, if there is any domestic transaction with these specified businesses, transfer pricing provisions will become applicable. So this was with regards to domestic. So what about international? Yes, the entire mainly the chapter is concerned with international transactions. International transactions between two or more associated enterprises. International transaction between two or more associated enterprises. The question comes, sir, what is an international transaction and what is an associated enterprise? So your international transaction, if any one of the party, if any one of the party, at least one is your non-resident, it will be considered as your international taxation. Okay, sir, what is associated enterprise? Associated enterprise that is defined under section your 92A. 92A specifies what an associated enterprise is. So your 92A talks about if, 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 if at any time, if at any time during the previous year, if at any time during the previous year, certain conditions, certain percentages were uh, reached, in such a case, both those parties will be considered as associated enterprise. So first, A holds 26% voting share in B. If A holds 26% voting share in B, in such a case, both your A and B will be considered as an associated enterprise. Okay, next. C holds 26% voting share in A and 26% voting share in B. If C holds... 26% voting share in A and 26% voting share in B. My C and A of course are associated enterprise. My C and B of course are associated enterprise. But my A and B will also become my associated enterprises. Okay. What does the next case talk about? A holds 26% voting share in B and B holds 26% voting share in C. That means A holds 26% voting share in B and B holds 26% voting share in C. When I'm, when I'm saying 26%, it means 26% or more. Okay. So if B holds 26% voting share in C, then in such a case, of course, A and B are associated enterprises. Of course, B and C are associated enterprises. But the question comes that boss is A and C associated enterprise. Are A and C associated enterprises? The answer is yes. A and C are also associated enterprises. Okay, what, what is the next? A appoints more than 50% board of directors of B. If A appoints more than 50% board of directors of B, your A and B are both associated enterprises. Next, if A gives a loan to B, if A gives a loan to B greater than 51% of the book value of assets of B, if B's book value of assets, if B's book value of assets, say for example, is 100 crores, and A gives the loan, A gives the loan of say for example 52 crores. So if A gives the loan to be greater than 51% of assets of B, in such a case A and B are both related, uh, associated enterprises. Next, if A guarantees borrowing greater than 10% of B's total borrowing, if A gives the guarantee to another, to another third party that sir if B does not pay, don't worry, I will pay you. If A guarantees more than 10% of total borrowings, A and B are your associated enterprises. A supplies raw materials. A supplies raw materials greater than 90% of B's total requirements. B's total annual requirements. If A supplies more than 90% of B's total annual requirements of raw material, A and B will be your associated enterprises. And your last, 
A's business is wholly dependent on the know-how or patent of B, A and B will be associated enterprises. Another thing that you have to remember, if you do any transaction, if you do any transaction with a person who belongs to a non-jurisdictional area, that is your Cypress, Switzerland or non-jurisdictional area. So any transaction with any person in a non-jurisdictional area will be deemed, will be deemed to be an associated enterprise and an international transaction. Of course, of course, if any person belongs to your Cypress, Switzerland, any non-jurisdictional area and you do any transaction with them, it will be considered to be an associated enterprise. That person will be considered to be an associated enterprise and this transaction will be considered to be an international transaction and automatically transfer pricing provisions will be applicable on you. Another thing you have to remember any transaction done with these people TDS will be at the rate of 30%. This have also included in the TDS chart. TDS chart that we made in two pages also have uploaded the video. This is also mentioned over there. The TDS irrespective of the transaction has to be deducted at 30%. Now next, now next, the entire thing that we, we I told you the chapter is about that is your arm's length price computation. So they have given you five methods. They have given you five methods to calculate your arm's length price. You have to use whichever method is most suitable. This is given under section 92C. 92C gives your arm's length price computation. You have to use your most suitable method. So comparable first method is your comparable uncontrolled price method. What do you do? You have entered into a transaction with an associated enterprise. You have to find similar transaction that other people have entered in, in this. You have to find a similar controllable, uncontrolled, comparable, you, it has to be comparable, both the transactions should be comparable, it should be uncontrolled, that means it should happen as per market forces. Comparable, uncontrolled price method, that is your CVPM. First, price charged in comparable, uncontrolled transaction, that is what is the original transaction, what is the price at which that transaction has happened, which transaction which you are comparing. Adjust any differences, any any small minute differences that your transaction and their difference might have. You have to adjust the differences, and then you will be you will be able to calculate your arm's length price. Second is your resale price method. That is, you use this method when you sold the goods to your associated enterprise, and associated enterprise further resells the same goods to someone else. Now, in such a case, you you start with your reverse journey. So, for example, this is you. This is your associated enterprise. And this is another third person to whom the associated enterprise has sold. Okay, so both these people, both are, both, this is you, this is the associated enterprise and this is the buyer. Okay, so what we have to find, we have to find the transaction that has occurred between both of these people, that means between you and your associate in the price, we have to find the arm's length price of this transaction. So in the resale price method, what do you do? We start reverse. We start that boss, what is the value, price at which it is resold by your AE, that is what is the transaction that has occurred between these two people. First you, first you find the transaction value of these two people. Then what do you do? You subtract the profit margin. So you subtract the normal GP margin because this associated enterprise, this associated enterprise will of course add its profit and sell it further. So you subtracted that profit and you will also subtract any additional cost, any additional cost that he must he may have incurred after you sold the good to him. So if all of these have been subtracted, basically you will reach to the transaction of you and your AE. So therefore price at which it is resold by AE minus your normal GP minus margin minus additional purchase expenses and you will get the arm's length price between you and your AE. Next, next is your cost plus method. Now in, uh, in the resale price method we went reverse. In the cost plus method you will go, you will first find the cost, you will add profit and you will get your arm's length production. So first is cost, you will add your normal and any, your normal GP margin and any differences you will add and you will get your arm's length price. Next is your profit split method. Profit split method is of course when you are entering into joint venture when there are when there is you and another person involved profit will be split. So cost incurred by SEC plus any share in profit. Now the share in profit will be in the, in the ratio of manpower employed or how much risk has been taken. This after adding you will get your arm's length price. And last is your transaction net margin method that is your TNMM. So consider profit earned by other players in the same industry and you will determine what the arm's length price is. 
I will tell you most important, most important is your CUPM method because this they ask the most. So therefore, make sure you do you solve questions for this. There is also a question bank available on the website. It's only for 99 rupees for uh, each subject is 99. You'll get a soft copy. So if you still need practice, do order those or which are faculties question banks you are using. Okay. Now next, next is your ALP determination. That means for example, for example, these five methods I told you. Now under these five methods, if for example, we did the UPM method that is your comparable transaction. If I found 15 such comparable transactions, then in such a case, each transaction ALP will be different. So now the question is, which ALP do I have to take? Do I have to take the lowest? Do I have to take the highest? How do I decide which ALP do I have to consider? So in such a case, they've defined, they have differentiated that if you have, if your number of ALPs are 2, 3, 4 or 5, that means 5 or less. If your number of ALPs are 5 or less, you will be doing the average method. What does that mean? Take all the ALPs, for example, you have 4 ALPs, add all those 4 ALPs divided by 4. Find the average of those ALPs. So if your number of ALPs are 5 or less, you simple, plain and simple, take out an average and that will be considered as your ALP. Okay. Now, for example, if your transaction, your transaction you did at 100 and the ALP is and the average ALP that we calculated is 102. Now, in such a case, does this mean that boss, how oh, you did not do it at ALP, your actual transaction should have happened at 102? No. So, income tax has given you a buffer of 3%. Income tax has given you a buffer of 3%. That if the ALP is within the range of 3% of actual transaction price. So, over here, our actual transaction price was 100. So, if the 3%, that means if if my ALP comes between 100 to 103, in such a case, in such a case, I will be ignoring the ALP. That means one, this 102 is useless. Since this is within this range of 3%, my actual transaction price will only be considered as my ALP. That is, I have done a proper arm's length price trade. Okay, now what if this does not come within this 3%? What if instead of 102, what if this was 106? Now, since this 106 does not come in this range, my ALP will be 106. I hope this is clear to you. Another thing, instead of 3%, it will be 1%. In case of wholesale trading, in case of wholesale trading, this range that is given, instead of from 100 to 103, it will become 100 to 101. Okay. Now, this was your average ALP. That is when it is less than 5. That is 5 or less number of ALPs are there. Now, what if there are more than 5? What if there are 6 or more? So, in such a case, you will be using the range concept. So, now, how does the range concept work? For example, for example, you have, for example, you have 10 ALPs. Okay. Just a second. Hmm. So, for example, if you have 10 ALPs, let, let, let us consider the ALP start from, say, example, 95, 97, 99, 101, 103, 105, 110, 111, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Need two more, no? Hmm? So these are your 10 ALP. For example, these are your 10 ALP that you have calculated. Now the question is, with what, what ALP do I consider? So step one is arrange all ALPs in ascending order. So I have arranged all the ALPs in ascending order already. Step two, give serial numbers starting from 1, 2, 3 till Z. So I, I will be giving them serial numbers. So let me do it in another color. So serial number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. So I have given our 10 serial numbers. Okay, step two is also done. Step 3. Calculate 35th percentile. Now, how do I calculate 35th percentile? Is Z into 0 0.35. Z is basically the last serial number. So, our last serial number is 10. So, 10 into 0 0.35, that comes to 3.5. And 10 into 0 0.65, that comes to 0 0.65. So, if the value is in decimals, of course, our value comes in decimals, correct? Our value comes is 3.5 and 6.5. Uh, our value comes to 3.5 and 6.5. If it is in decimal, you will upper round off and ALP at this serial number will be ALP. So upper round off means this 3.5 will become 4, 6.5 will become 7. So now my 35th percentile, 
my 35th percentile will become 101 understood because alp at fourth serial number so 35th percentile is 101 and 65th percentile is 110 so if my transaction if my transaction is within this range it is okay or even if it is less than this range it is still okay however 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 so if the alp value of 35th percentile if my actual transaction price is between 35th and 65th percentile my alp is your transaction price that means the transaction price the price at which i have done the transaction that itself is my alp if not then you will multiply it with 0. 5 that is the 0 0.5 that means your 103 10 into 0 0.5 your 103 will become your alp no why 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 because 10 into 0 0.5 comes to 5 now 5 is a whole number 5 is your whole number when the value is a whole number whole number and whole number plus 1 that means you have to take average, you have to take average of your fifth and sixth term that is 103 and 105. Average of this comes to 104. 104 will be your ALB because you have to take whole number and whole number plus 1. The whole number we got 5 plus 1 is 6. So you have to take average of ALP at these serial numbers. So average of ALP at these serial numbers is 103 and 105. Average comes to 104. 104 will, will be considered as your ALP. That is in case because you have to determine that what will be your ALP. Great. Now next is AO to determine ALP if SSE fails to obtain A. Let me just change the pen color. AO to determine ALP if SSE fails to compute ALP as per the most appropriate method. Data used for ALP is not reliable, documents not maintained or fail to submit as per section 92D. Okay, so we will be discussing 92D later that is your maintenance of information and documents. Okay, now note, if income of one associated enterprises increases, of course, your we, we, we do transfer pricing only when we have to increase the income. So if income of one associated enterprise increase, does this mean that since income of this enterprise increase, we will, we will increase the expense of the other en enterprise? No. So income of other uh, associated enterprise shall not change. That means I neither expense nor income. Deduction under chapter 6 is not allowed against increased income. For example, if you, are, if, you, if you are not able to utilize your entire 6 year deduction and now since this income you have increased, does this mean that you will be allowed to use more 6 year deduction? No. So, Against this increased income, we will not allow you any new 6 year deduction. Next, deduction under 10A also will not be allowed either. This is your SEZ 10AA. Great. Now, next is your section 92CA that is reference to TP officer. So, this we also did if you remember while 92CA reference came while doing your assessment chapter also. So, AO may refer computation of ALP to TPO with either CIT or PCIT approval. So AO may tell that boss, please you calculate and will send it to the TPO that is your transfer pricing officer. TPO to gather information and can consider other international transactions too if it comes to his knowledge. Order of TPO is binding on your AO. Order to be passed before 60 days of last date for assessment completion under section 153 and 153B. Time limit allowed under section 153 and 153b shall be increased by one year if case has been referred to TPO. So if the case, if it has been referred to TPO, the original time limit that you have in section 153 and 153b, that will be increased by one year. This is your section 92C. Okay. Now 92D. SSE required to maintain documents specified by CBDT, that is your TP study report, your transfer pricing study report. AO or your CIT appeal may require person to furnish information within 30 days of notice. Documents required to be maintained only if international transaction value is more than 1 crores and documents required to be kept for 8 years from the end of relevant assessment year. Okay, so these documents you have to keep for a period of 8 years. Section 92E talks about assessing to file TP report 
of CA in form 3CEB up to 31st October of the assessment year. So this report has to be filed by 31st October. Next is your section 92CC. 92CC talks about your APA that is your advanced pricing agreement. So what was happening that was each transaction I enter into, each transaction I have to calculate the TP, then uh, the ALP and then more cases were keep on pending. So therefore what happened, you, you contact the department beforehand that boss I am going to enter into transactions. You tell me how you want me to price these agreements. So therefore CBDT may enter into advanced pricing agreement with person to determine ALP or method of determining ALP. They do this beforehand. APA is applicable for a maximum period of five years. That means once, once entered into transaction, this will maximum be applicable for five years and you will have to enter into a new fresh APA. Now the thing is about rollback provision. That means if I enter into an APA today, if I enter into an APA today, how, how long ago can I apply this? So to reduce pending cases, similar transactions entered into the last four years from date of entering into APA will also be dealt as per the APA. That means in the coming five years, I will, all my transaction will be dealt as per APA and all the previous transactions in the last four years will also be dealt as per APA. Return of relevant previous year of rollback should have been furnished before the due date. The return should have been furnished. Report of international transaction should have been furnished as per your section 92E. It will not be applicable, your rollback provision that is of your four years, it will not be applicable. Determination of ALP for said year has been appealed before ITAT or and ITAT has passed order disposing of such appeal before signing the APF. So if you have already appealed before the ITAT, your rollback provisions will not be applicable. Application of rollback provision reduces income or increases losses compared to return file. So your APA will not be applicable. Your APA will not be applicable if the application of the rollback provision, your rollback provision will not be applicable if its application will reduce the income or increase the losses. Now points that you have to remember. If rollback option is taken, you either have to take for all four years or none at all. You cannot say that, sir, can I do only for two years? No, you have to take for all four years. Next, not possible to take only rollback provision and not APA for future year. That means you cannot say that, sir, I will only take rollback for four years. I will not take for the future five years. You have to take for both of them. Next, if A and B merge to become C, if A and B merge to become C, neither A nor B nor C can apply for rollback because they have merged. If A acquires B, A can take rollback, but B cannot. That means the acquirer can take the rollback provision, but B cannot. Next, once, once APA has been entered into SSE to furnish modified return for previous years to which APA is applicable. Of course, now since they will be dealt as per APA, you have to furnish a modified return within three months from end of month of entering into APA, three months from end of month into entering APA. How do you remember this? A, P, A are three letters. So therefore three months from end of month. If SSC of any previous year is pending, if the assessment of any previous year is pending, AO gets one more extra year to complete your as per APA. And if it is completed, AO can modify total income within one year from end of financial year when modified return filed. Okay. Now next is your section 94B. 94B is very important, mostly asked in exam, is your limitation of interest deduction. Remember section 94B, section 94B will only be applicable if your interest payment is more than 1 crore and it is an Indian company. If it is an Indian company paying interest to a NR, if your Indian company is paying interest to a non resident and the interest amount is more than 1 crore, section 94B becomes applicable. But sir, what is section 94B? 94B says that the maximum interest allowed, 94B says that the maximum interest allowed is 30%, 30% of EBIT DA, that is earning before interest tax depreciation and amortization, earning before interest tax depreciation and amortization, maximum interest that we will allow you is 30%. Balance will be disallowed in the current year. Balance is not disallowed. Balance is disallowed in the current year. That means in this year we will not allow you. This for example, 
disallowed interest can be carry forwarded till eight years. For example, your this year, for example, this year, EBIT DA was say for example hundred crores, and the interest payment that you made was forty crores. Now what do they say? They say that we will allow you only thirty crores because thirty percent of EBIT DA. So thirty crores we have allowed you this year. This ten crore, this ten crore we will allow you to use in the next year also. Because in the next year, for example, if you only paid eighteen crores as interest and your EBIT DA is still hundred crores, how much are you allowed? You are allowed thirty crores. You still have balance twelve crores that you can take. So therefore, this twelve crores you will use from the previous year and you will still have two crores left. Okay, so you will you can total claim twenty eight crores in the next year, but in one in one year maximum that you can claim is thirty percent. Great. Okay. Next is your country by country report. Just a second. Okay. Next is your country by country report. So report with information on revenue. Profit before tax, tax paid country-wise, should be submitted by parent entity in country of residence. If the total group revenue, group revenue means due plus your subsidiary, everything included. If your group revenue in last year is sixty four hundred crores or more, that is six thousand four hundred crores or more, then this report has to be submitted. This is called your country by country report. Constituent entity should furnish report in India. If parent entity is not obliged to file report or India does not have a report exchange agreement, constituent entity means not the parent entity but any entity that is below it. So constituent entity should furnish report in India if the parent entity is not obliged or if we do not have such exchange agreement with that country. Coming to your last part of this chapter and we are we are done with transfer pricing. Last part of this chapter, very 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 important part is your section ninety two C E. 92 C talks about your secondary adjustment. Secondary adjustment is basically first when while determining ALP, while determining ALP that is your primary adjustment, and there is a secondary adjustment that happens because of the primary adjustment. So any adjustment in books of accounts of your associated enterprise to reflect the actual allocation of profit between SSC and AE are consistent. So any adjustment, any adjustment. That is done. This is called your secondary adjustment. Now, if due to transfer pricing we increase the income of one entity by say for example five crores. So now, what does the income tax department say that boss? Since you originally had to do the transaction at the price more than more five crores more, you have to get this money from that country. You need to get this money into India. So secondary adjustment done only when the primary adjustment. Primary adjustment is your determination of ALP. So only when the primary adjustment has been CO moto made by SSC in his return, if the SSC has done by himself, the excess money that means whatever income you have increased, the excess money should be reduced, should be bought from another country, bought from that country whichever you have done the transaction within ninety days. Okay, it is all ninety days. What changes is from when? That is ninety days from due date of ROI. If it is made by assessing officer and accepted by SSC. Ninety days from the date of order of your AO, if it is determined by your AP, that is your advance pricing agreement. Remember, plus five minus four, plus five minus four, five years in the future, four years in the past. You cannot take only four. You can take only five, but if you take four, you have to take all four. You cannot take in parts. So if it is determined by APA and APA is entered after due date to file ROI, then ninety days from end of month in which APA has entered. However, if APA was entered before due date to file ROI, it will be ninety days from due date of ROI. So due date of ROI, due date of ROI. So when due to primary adjustment, when due to primary adjustment income increases or losses decrease, this increase in income shall be repatriated. That is within ninety days to India. That is due to primary adjustment. We want that boss. You get this additional income. You get this additional income into India. You need to repatriate it. If it is not repatriated, it will be deemed loan to associated enterprise. That means, for example, if you did the transaction at hundred crores, and the ALP comes to one twenty crores, that means that trans that entity should pay you twenty crores more, correct? Because that is the actual transaction. And if that entity has not paid you twenty crores, if you are not able to get that twenty crores within ninety days, what happens? 
we will be doing secondary adjustment on you we will be treating that you have given them 20 crores as loan we will be treating that you have given them 20 crores as loan and we'll start charging you notional we will start charging you income that you have earned notional interest and we will charge you tax on that so it will be if not repatriated it will be deemed loan to associated enterprise and interest will be added as income each year notional interest will be added in your income so if your transaction was in rupees or if your transaction was in other than rupees that means in a foreign currency so if your transaction is, is in rupees the rate will be sbi rate on 1st april of the previous year plus 3.25 percent whatever the sbi rate is going on you have to add 3.25 percent and so this is as per as on 1st april of the previous year however 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 if your transaction is other than rupees that means if it is in a foreign currency it will be six months LIBOR it will be six months LIBOR as on 30th September of previous year please make sure you, you remember this date because in the exam they will give you LIBOR on multiple dates so you have to do that LIBOR as on 30th September plus three percent so SBI it is plus 3.25 percent LIBOR it is plus three percent so LIBOR plus three percent and note 90 days time limit only for repatriation ignore for the interest calculation no secondary adjustment if primary adjustment is less than 1 crore so this secondary adjustment this interest calculation this repatriation all of this will be done only and only if your primary adjustment if your primary adjustment is more than 1 crore only and only in such a case it will be done if it is less than 1 crore we will not be doing any secondary adjustment next SSE can instead pay additional tax on primary adjustment so if the SSE feel that boss I am not going to get that money from them in such a case uh, what happens otherwise we will keep charging interest every year and this will never end so what we have given them an exit option that SSE can instead pay additional tax on primary adjustment on your primary adjustment you pay tax at 18% plus 12% surcharge plus 4% health and education says which comes to 20.964% you pay that tax and we will be considered as a one time payment so we will not be charging you interest 20.964% no secondary adjustment, no repatriation required if you have paid your additional tax and interest calculated till additional tax has been paid. Interest will be calculated till that date. And with this, we are done with our chapter of transfer pricing and I will see you in the next one.